people. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what I do in my life um, in terms of recreation, which is making fashion technology, wearable fashion technology, as well as work. Um, I'm doing a PhD that involves creating human organs. So, first of all, hello everyone. My name is Rachel. Uh, I go by Konnichiwa Kitty, especially when I share my fashion technology, technology projects mainly because uh, I do feel it, like my projects have quite a Japanese aesthetic, a fashion aesthetic. So um, I'm also a maker, hacker, fashion tech designer, stem cell scientist, as well as a mental health advocate. I'm also becoming more and more of a STEM ambassador because I realize that when I do these talks or I go and exhibit my projects, people are just very, very shocked to find out that I do anything STEM related. <laughs> Um, just because of how I look, really. So, yeah, I think, I think it's pretty fun to be a STEM ambassador. Um, yeah, so if you are also interested in following my projects, I am on social media as Konnichiwa Kitty. So, why am I speaking today? I thought that this slide would be quite important just because I will be talking about several subtopics. So, mainly I will be talking about what is wearable technology and how I see wearable technology in terms of fashion technology. Secondly, just to scare you a little bit about the future of medicine, where we currently stand, um, how to create human organs, and why we're creating human organs in the lab. <laughs> um, I would also um, like to just say that, you know, I do give talks and exhibit to encourage people to try STEM education or STEM subjects. And in general, just to try new skills like I have uh, to do fashion as well as grow human organs, like, you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, just to share my experience in general, why I'm doing two extremely different things in terms of mental health. So first of all, let me introduce you to wearable technology. In other words, it's also known as wearables. So what is wearable tech? Wearable tech is a blanket term for electronics that can be worn on the body either as an accessory or part of material used in clothing. In other words, um, the cloth will act as a carrier and you attach electronics to it, or it can be incorporated into the material. So what do people think when they hear wearable technology? For some reason, I never really Googled wearable technology until I was actually making it and wearing it, and I was like, oh, it's a wearable, you know? Um, and when I looked at wearable technology, it gave me a lot of results that reflected things like fitness trackers, Fitbits are really popular, um, smartwatches, VR headsets. And that wasn't what I was looking for because I already had in mind, you know, I was looking for things that are more my aesthetic. Um, so just to be not biased, I tried to look at what people think of wearables. <laughs> I was quite surprised because I was so hyped. I was like, yeah, go wearables. And then I was like, what? <laughs> so I did a bit more digging. Um, and then I found this um, article where Forbes was interviewing Credit Suisse. And you know, Credit Suisse was just saying that um, in 2013, that you know, the revenue from wearables would increase by billions. But it's not actually changed very much. It's been stagnant. Credit Suisse also claimed that it is a much more diversified market than investors realize. Does anyone want to point out the diversity in there? <laughs> I mean, it looks really monotone to me, and like, to that little pink top for women, and it's not even in the right pink, it's a salmon pink. So, <laughs> I was like, this, this is not right, you know? Um, and then I decided that you know it might be a good idea just to introduce people to what wearable tech could be as well. So as we now know, wearable tech can be separated into two main categories, health tech and fashion tech. So as we now know, health tech involves things like fitness trackers, it tells you how many steps you've taken, so on and so forth, connects all your information to the internet so you can understand it better. Um, fashion tech, on the other hand, believes in clothing with expressions. What does that mean? It means that if you wear an item of clothing, you should be able to express yourself with it. It should perhaps reflect how you feel or enhance how you're feeling things. An example would be if you're watching a theatrical performance and you're wearing a top that sends little vibrations. So that makes your theatrical performance like 40. It's so much better and you feel enhanced by it. 
It doesn't believe in attaching a phone or a laptop to your body because at the end of the day, you're still going to want your laptop, you're still going to want your phone for ease of accessibility. Fashion tag as well is relatable to everyone. Every day you have to make a conscious fashion decision. What does that mean? It means that when you wake up in the morning, you're like, does this top go with this brown trousers? Or thus, do I, should I wear this pink check top because it reflects my skin tone today? So just things like that. Fitness trackers, on the other hand, for you to harness its full potential, you need to understand the information given to you. How many <coughs> calories you burn relative to how much you weigh? So that alone already has a smaller population of people using health tech. So as I said earlier, um, when I looked at wearables, it was really hard to find what I was looking for. So I'd like to just give you guys some examples of wearable fashion technology, the companies that are creating it, as well as the makers. So Cute Circuit is a company that has been designing um, dresses for people like Katy Perry. They also sell their products, um, and they have designed dresses that you know, can reflect the music when Katy Perry performs in American Idol and things like that. There is also a maker known as Anouk Wiprek. She creates her fashion tech using servos and 3D printing. And she creates these um, spider-like projections that poke at people who come into her personal space. <laughs> I think that's amazing. <laughs> so following that, this is an example where um, technology is used to create the product that is born. Um, and in this instance, they create prosthetic covers that uses technology like CNC milling, laser etching, and 3D printing. So I'm going to show you some of my personal fashion tech projects. So this is a floral necklace that is made using fine neopixel rings. It's controlled by the Raspberry Pi Zero and the Raspbio Fat, and it is programmed with Python. So I was just thinking, you know, like, I could make a necklace. It can be a chunky necklace, it can be a floral necklace, but I have the resources and the materials and the information to combine the electronics with a necklace. So this is what I produce. I was gonna show this at the hardware showcase yesterday, but I was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a lot more mesmerizing. When I talk to people and I'm wearing it, people get very distracted. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on. Um, this is actually the very first fashion tech project that I've ever created. So I took a gap year where I was just tinkering with various things. This included um, jewelry making, and I found out that I really love to create hair accessories. I meant to be wearing my cat ears today, but I left it at the whole cat room, so let's forget about that. Um, yeah, so I thought that, you know, um, at the same time, I was just thinking like, hey, you know, there are a lot of code clubs around that are free. There's Raspberry Jams that teaches uh, Python and things like that. And I just thought like, what if I combine both of these things? And so I produced this hit piece. It's very simple, but it's very fun. And it, it definitely generates um, conversations. <laughs> So again, this is controlled by the Raspberry Pi Zero and a Pimorotni Unicorn Pack. So um, another thing that I have decided to do is to write a tutorial on how to embed electronics into resin. I've not gone as far as embedding electronics that involve programming yet, but really simple electronics. And I just really want to encourage people to try interdisciplinary fields such as combining crafting or, in the sense, jewelry making with electronics. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, and so this concludes the part of wearable technology. I will now take you into the future of medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about stem cells and tissue and engineering, what it is and um, what we can do with it. So tissue engineering is a use of a combination of cells, engineering, uh, materials and methods, and growth factors to improve or replace biological tissues. In other words, uh, we need these four things for tissue engineering. 
first of all, we need, so tissue engineering is the creation of organs. Um, first of all, what we will need is stem cells. So our stem cells basically act as building blocks, building blocks of an infrastructure. We also need scaffolds. As you know, when you build a building, you will need scaffolding to hold the place up so that you can add these building blocks too. Third, we will need growth factors. These growth factors are what will tell these stem cells to specialize and mature into particular organs. And they are usually um, sent through the vasculature. So like in our body right now, um, our cells are fed through our blood vessels. <laughs> Lastly, the goal of tissue engineering is to create an off-the-shelf pick-and-mix kind of shop that you can go to in the future and be like, hey, I think my liver is not working very well. Um, maybe I can get a replacement with enhanced growth factors because, you know, I, 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 I love my drinks. So I think. <laughs> yeah. So um, on top of that, the goal of teaching engineering is to overcome obstacles in um, organ transplants, such as the need for an organ donor, the need for a match, and to overcome problems such as organ rejection, because the organ created will be truly yours. So what are stem cells? So stem cells can become any one of the cells in your body, any organ in your body. They are basically a mass of cells. Um, sorry, that was not said correctly. So during embryonic uh, development, the mass of cells that starts out to create an embryo is a mass of stem cells. And during embryonic development, that mass of stem cells starts to elongate and contribute to different parts of the body due to different growth factors um, in different regions. So these stem cells can be any part of the body when they mature and given the right growth factors. So this is how we enhance the use of stem. Uh, yeah, this is how we harness the use of stem cells to create particular organs. Currently, the stem cells that we get can be from embryos or can be from an adult patient. We can obtain stem cells by taking a simple skin biopsy, which will be skin cells. We then give it a lot of growth factors to think that it's in an embryonic environment. So it then goes back against time, it reverses aging, and becomes an embryonic stem cell, which is which we call an induced stem cell. When we obtain these stem cells, which will have the genetic background of the patient, we can then again push it towards the particular organ lineage that we want to. So, as I said earlier, the next thing that we need is scaffolds. How can we obtain how can we obtain scaffolding? So, one of the ways that we can obtain scaffolding is through getting these organs either from a patient, um, which is not ideal if they're alive. <laughs> um, we can get them from uh, a patient who has passed away, so it doesn't have to be a fresh organ. We can also get them from animals. The reason why we can use scaffolding from these various sources is because when we obtain the organ, we strip it of all its cells and DNA. Um, the cells and DNA are what makes, it, makes that organ personalized. It's what causes organ rejection. The extracellular, the transparent extracellular matrix that you obtain once you strip all the cells and DNA has no characteristic of where it was from. So this allows us to see the patient cells onto the extracellular matrix. So the reason why we've decided to use um, scaffolding from an organ rather than to create our own is because that we have not been able to create the intricate extracellular matrix that is produced by nature. When we see these cells on this scaffolding, we realize that they are a lot happier because they feel, they kind of feel at home and they feel that it has all the you know, little roots for it to form vasculature and so on, and it feels very natural for them. They are much happier reconstituting a natural uh, matrix. Following that, there are other methods to create scaffolds that has been tried, and this includes 3D bioprinting. Uh, I'm sure quite a few of you are familiar with 3D printing, so the difference between regular 3D printing and 3D bioprinting is that um, in a bioprinter, while it prints the scaffold, it is also growing cells at the same time. While it is printing the scaffold layer by layer, it, can, it will also have a nozzle that can spray the cells onto the scaffold. 
The environment of the 3D bioprinter is also different because it has to be a sterile environment where the cells can grow. But as I said before, we are currently preferring natural um, scaffolding. So to give you an idea of um, what I'm doing as part of my PhD project, <coughs> to make it simple, I use stem cells to grow eyeballs. Um, <laughs> to make, uh, yeah, so in other words, it means that I use stem cells to grow optic vesicles, which are tiny versions of eyeballs, for us to study non-invasively what has gone wrong in the patient. So um, I'm currently studying a, a congenital blindness. So this means that the patient is most likely to have a genetic defect. So in order to firstly understand which function within the retina has gone wrong that has contributed to the loss of sight, we will use the patient cells to grow the retina. We then carry out studies such as um, fluorescent studies to identify if the cells are correctly formed. In this case, we are looking at light sensitive cells, which are photoreceptors. And we can see here that we have nicely formed um, an arrangement of cells which in this case doesn't require a scaffolding. We have learned that the optic vesicle structure tends to form by itself and it's unique compared to other organs. When we put it in an environment that is correct, they start to form 3D optic cups. And we were surprised to see that it started forming its own arrangements too. Um, when we identify the problem in the layers of cells, we then try to understand what are the genes involved in carrying out those processes. So to correct a gene, we use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene editing tool. We correct that gene that is not, that's not functioning. We then, once it's corrected, we then grow these optic visibles again and retest them using various um, assays. So that's about it for stem cells. Um, moving on to what, why I'm doing two extremely different things um, and um, what I've learned from it so far. So um, the reason why I have um, started to just you know, show people what I do, to just discuss about it, to exhibit my projects is because I realized that when I started sharing it on social media, I had a lot of um, children or like parents of children who have said that, you know, they've been looking for someone who can inspire them, someone who can show them that if they were to do something that is STEM related, that they don't have to be repressed into stereotypes and look like Albert Einstein, <laughs> you know, because that, that is just not true. So that is one of the reasons why I've decided to start showcasing more of my stuff. Um, and um, I've come across a lot of little girls who said that, you know, they like, Children these days, they're so easily influenced by things they see on YouTube. And I think one of the most famous people on YouTube are people who do beauty, blogging, makeup, and things like that. So when they see things like that and they feel they have to choose, I'm here to say, no, you can do them both. Because I'm doing fashion, and I'm also growing eyeballs. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is possible. And yeah, so one of the things that I want people to know is that even though you have a legit passion, like the way I love um, my stem cell research, it is still worth trying to find out what else you can love. Um, so just to show you an idea how much I love my job. <laughs> so basically, this was my life um, for a very, very long time. Um, I felt that, you know, I felt so lucky to find a job or a profession that I love because I feel that there are a lot of people who are forced to do things uh, to work a job that they don't love just to support the thing that they love. So because I felt so lucky, I felt like, you know, I have to put my time into it. Um, I also felt like I was doing life-changing research, so I should like spend every second of it. Um, and I was very, I was, I was pleased that I got a job that I really loved, and because I loved it so much, I felt like nothing else matters. Um, and I was so focused on this that I couldn't actually tell if anything else within me was going wrong, whether I needed a social life. Um, and then I actually uh, experienced burnout. Burnout over something that I love. 
you know, I thought, okay, burnout is common if you're doing, you're forced to do something that you don't love. But I felt burnout doing something that I love. So this was why I was prescribed recreation. Um, I, when I thought I was taking recreation, I would go to a park, but I'll bring a research paper with me. That is work. <laughs> that, yeah, so that is work. When um, I was prescribed recreation, I was told that I can't do anything research related. So even if I'm avidly reading a book, I need to sort of like slow down and read it like a normal person. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was when I started incorporating different things. And that was um, when I tried making. So I took a gap year where I was just making and trying different things because I didn't know what my hobby was. I didn't know if I liked anything else. Um, this is where I realized that when I discussed with various people, they said that they're afraid to try new things because they might not be good at it. Because what they're doing now, they're good at it. And what if they don't like it? What if it's a waste of time? But how would you know? How would you know that you're not going to be good at it? How would you know you're not going to like it if you don't try it? So this is where I encourage people to try it. And then at least you'd be able to close that chapter of the book. You'd be like, I tried it. There is no more what if. What if I did that? What if I tried that? No, you've done it. You know, and you can move on. Since I started making, my life is so much more colorful. My pie chart of life is not just work. Um, and it has really helped my mental health because I struggle with depression, I struggle with anxiety, and I found that making made my life different in the sense that I go to work, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm stepping up the day, I'm all fresh. And then when I come home from work, I'm not like, oh my god, I'm so tired, I just want to pass out. I leave work feeling like, oh yes, I have this fresh idea in my brain. Um, I'm going to like start working on it. Uh, but, you know, if you go too hard on that, you could also be headed to a burnout. So setting boundaries is also very important. Um, this is why I don't, my work has been, instead of three quarters, I have to section it at least into half. So boundaries are equally important. And um, yeah, I just want to say that, you know, I believe that having variety does make life a lot better. And yeah, and thank you. <laughs>
Okay, I'm close about this. Do you uh, rely on, on your hobby uh, on a financial basis or would you rather not go that Um. So, I am on a scholarship for my work, which comes with a stipend that helps. Not very much when you're in London. Um, <laughs> Um, the making side of things has also developed into a small business at the moment simply because I realized that when I exhibit stuff, people have been asking me, can you make this, can you make that, or will you sell it? So that is where it is at the moment. Um, I realized that there isn't that much pressure in trying to create so much because a lot of the people who request custom pieces or who really want your thing are willing to wait. So that gives me yeah, a little bit of leeway, but it does provide me uh, a side income as well. All right, we've got our time limit, um, but it's lunch now, so if you want to stick around and ask more questions afterwards, yes. I'm sure we'll take some. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, thank Rachel again.